this evening. If you have your Bibles with us, open up to the book of Joshua. <clears throat> I apologize for my voice. <clears throat> Let's get straightened out. The book of Joshua, chapter 6, and we'll start in verse 11 in just a minute. Chapter 6, verse 11. I want to do a little review from two weeks ago. Last week, Brother Jeremy brought us a great message from the book of Matthew. The last time we were in Bible study, we looked at these things. I just want to bring you up to speed really fast. That you had to have consecration before you could have conquest. The first thing when they crossed the river, see, my question would be, why didn't you do this on the other side of the river? Before you crossed over, you're sitting right in front of Jericho, and you take knives and disable your entire army. <laughs> Circumcise the entire army. You know what you call that? Faith. Faith. Wow. Then they had praise, worship, and remembrance as they had their third Passover celebration. They had celebrated Passover in Egypt, a Passover night. And then the first year they were out of Egypt, now it's been 39 years, they celebrate Passover together in God's land, in the land of Canaan. Hallelujah. Then we saw that God is always in control. When Joshua saw this heavily armed man, he could tell he was a mighty war warrior. He said, are you for us or adversaries? He said, no, <laughs> I'm not for you and I'm not for your adversaries. I'm here as the captain of the Lord's army. And that's what we like, doesn't it? We like that because we serve the captain of the Lord's army. He is called our captain. He is our leader. His name is the same name as Joshua, the man that was taught. His name is Yeshua, Jesus, our Savior. I see, and this is what he, Jesus said to him that day, the captain of the Lord's host. See, I have given in thy hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men thereof. All right, one more little thing to review, and then we'll get started this evening. I made a little note here. Jericho, that great walled city is in front of them now. They've been cleansed. They've been circumcised. They've been celebrating the Passover. They've worshiped God. They have the memorial stones in the river. They have the memorial stones at Gilgal. And now God has given them the plan of what they're supposed to do. And that's where we stopped at last week. Three times in chapter 6 we see the plan. Once God gives it to God gives it to Joshua. The next time Joshua gives it to the priest and to the captains of the army. And then the next time we see them carrying out the plan. Three times he gives them the plan, gives them the plan, gives them the plan. Do the plan. Do the plan. But I made a note here. We all have our Jerichos, don't we? We all have those walled cities that we have no way to conquer them. We don't have any way. There's no logical way. There's no ability way. There's no man can can't claim credit. Brother David had one of those things last week. And God moves. God moved. God moved. And we say, that's a Jericho experience. That's an experience that you can't take credit for, that God takes credit for. God Amen. did this. God did this. Then I made a note here. Maybe it's been a while since you've had a Jericho experience in your life that, that you faced something that you could not conquer. I remind you of this. We all have our last Jericho to face. There'll come a day... I don't care how rich you are, how poor you are, how young you are, how old you are, when that death angel will come. We'll take our last, last breath. And nothing we can do can get us to be with God. It's a God thing. By His grace, Amen. He washes our sins away. Amen. We all have that final Jericho, I guarantee you. That you cannot explain, you cannot comprehend, you just know I've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Amen. I love that. I love that. Okay, so let's get started on tonight's Bible study then. So the ark of the Lord can pass the city, going about it once. And they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. This is God's plan. And Joshua rose early in the morning. And the priest took up the ark of the Lord. It's, it's about ten times, at least ten times, mentioned in chapter 6, the ark of the Lord. Remember the last chapter was mentioned over a dozen times. He rises early in the morning. That's what Joshua does. You'll see that over and over in his life. 
Uh, in fact, before we finish this, we'll see him rising early in the morning because he's got to have someone put to death. Somebody said, I think it was one of the military commanders, uh, maybe when President George W. Bush was in, said something like, if you've got a distasteful job to do, rise early in the morning and do it. I'll say this, when you've got a good job to do, <laughs> rise early in the morning and do it. I love sitting out on the porch with my cup of coffee, my Bible, my daily bread. And I just sit out there. And I think God is so good. God is so good. Rise early in the morning. And the priest took up the ark of the Lord and the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns. This is not the military horns. Remember, it was very descriptive several, several months ago when Moses told them how exactly what metal to use, how to build the military horns. These are the horns of the ram's horns. These are worship horns because the military is going to be a part of this, but the military is not the main part. Worship is the main part. So they have their worship horns with them, and the, and the priests are carrying them. Before the ark of the Lord went out continually and blew them with the trumpet, the armed men went before them, and the rearward, this is the rest of the army, came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on with blowing with the trumpets, and the second day they could pass the city once and return to the camp. So they did six days. So I'm going to stop there just for a second. That's a ridiculous plan. That's right, I called it a ridiculous plan. A radical plan, a, uh, a weird plan, at least in human terms. March around the city, and God's going to make these two walls. Remember, I, I, I said a few weeks ago, I'd tell you about the walls, but I never did. The walls of Jericho, are it's a double-walled city. Now, there would only be about 20,000 people in the city, at this time, usually normally only about four or 5,000 people. But the, all the people from the surrounding areas would come. Then there was other fortresses built. That's how kings held on to their power. You could, If you invaded, you had to pass by because you couldn't conquer them. And Jericho has two, two walls, both of them so large that people can live inside the walls, on the walls. Then they have, they're about 14 feet apart, according to the archaeologists. They had... Uh, wooden ramps that would go across, like bridges would say, so you could go from one wall to the other wall. Of course, now, if that wall fell, the plan was to cut those, and then you have another wall to protect you. And you're going to defeat this city by walking around it? Now, it would take about an hour to walk around the city of Jericho. Now, you couldn't have the whole army. You couldn't have uh, 600,000 men go doing that. So probably... Most people say forty to 50,000 men are walking around the city of Jericho. The rest of the army is there. In fact, all the people are commanded to be there on the hill well, so they can watch. So that's like a million four hundred thousand women and children because all of Israel is going to shout and participate in this. But So I guess that, that's what's talking about the rear word and all this. So about 40,000, 50,000 men are going around the city. And they march around. It takes about an hour. They go back to the camp. They go back to the camp. They go back to the camp. Well, uh, God will get to glory. And I ask the question here, does God get to glory in your life? I don't want you to answer that out loud. I just want you to think about that. Does God get glory in your life? Uh, does he get glory in our church? Are we doing what we're supposed to do to bring honor to him? The Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God, the power of God, the Creator. It was a symbol of the Holy of Holies. I'm sure I, we covered this when we did this way back long, long time ago in the book of Leviticus. But we talked about how the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies, is what we see in Revelation chapter 5 and 6 in the, in the book of Revelation in the New Testament. They, they were a picture of the actual heavenly inner Holy of Holies and, and, the, and, the, and the throne room of God. And then when Solomon built his temple, again, the same measurements bigger but the same scales that God had for this because it's a picture of something specific. It's a picture of God's glory. But you know what the picture of God's glory is today? You. Now that's scary, isn't it? <laughs> Look in the mirror and say, hey, I'm looking at the glory of God and then you think, ooh, you know, am I living like I'm supposed to live? I doing what I'm supposed to do. Did, did I testify to my neighbor yesterday when he told me to? Did I did I witness to my co-worker? I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just I'm just asking you to think that we don't have the Ark of the Covenant for the throne room of God. 
His throne room now is your heart. He, the Holy Ghost lives in us. Now, I still can't even understand it. How could God be contained inside a human being? But he is, because that's what the Word of God says. Again, I don't have to understand it, Gail. I just have to believe it. I just have to believe it. I don't have to understand it. God, the Holy Ghost, indwells us. And we need to let him be, we need to be filled with the Spirit, walk in his power. All right, so, all right, day seven. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they arose early about the dawning of the day, a little earlier than normal, to pass the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they could pass the city seven times. All right, so so this will be several hours of marching, wouldn't it? If it takes about an hour to go around the city, this is going to be an all-day march. And they're probably looking up and seeing the archers on the walls. They're seeing, hopefully, the, 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 the scarlet rope hanging down from Rahab's house and know what that means. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the, police, uh, when the priest blew the trumpet, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. God has given you the victory. Now, before we get the victory, let's look at verse 17 through 19. The city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot. Now, keep underlining that every time. Because you're not alone, they're going to call her Rahab the harlot. <laughs> for the next 100 years, no. For the next 200 years, no. For the next 1,400 years, yes. 1,400 years, they call her the harlot. Guess what we still call her today? Rahab the harlot. She's not a harlot anymore. She's been bought by the blood. She's been cleansed. But I guess just as a reminder of what she used to be, I sure am glad we don't put up signs for a while. I'm sure we're glad we don't have to wear, the church, wear a sign to church. Here is Freddy the drunk. You know, here's Daniel the dope head. You know, I'm glad we don't have to wear that kind of stuff nowadays, you know. But that's what she's called, the harlot. But, but I want you to know that the word of curse there means devoted. If you have an NIV Bible, I think some of y'all use NIVs, it would, it'll say devoted. This is the devoted thing. Keep yourself away from the devoted things, okay? And the whole city shall be devoted to the Lord. Uh, if you have a, let's see, I looked up another translation too. The uh, CSB, my favorite translation, the Christian Standard Bible says the set apart things. And that's what it is. It's being set apart. You carry CSB, yeah, don't you, Brother David? You set apart. It's a set apart thing. Well, the King James has got the ideal right. It means it, it is given to God. So if you get involved, you're cursed. So the ideal is right, but the, they didn't translate the word correctly. The word is devoted, uh, set apart, holy, something given to God. But now when you look at that from our point of view, if you mess with it, you're going to be accursed because it belongs to God. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. So, so I'm, going to read, I'm reading from the King James, so you keep that in mind as I'm reading this. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are within her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. She had an action on her faith. She had faith. And the book of James says she had action on her faith. She moved on her faith. James said, show me your faith without, without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. He goes as far as to say that if you have faith without works, it's dead. Because faith should have changed you. Faith should make you live better than you used to live. And it certainly did her. You can see it immediately. And you in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, the thing devoted to God, lest you make yourselves accursed, when you shall take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel, the whole camp accursed, and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated, same thing, unto the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So let me talk about this a minute. Okay. So verse 17 through 19 told us about the instructions they get on victory. This is what we need to do. This is how you're going to get the victory. Do not take anything that belongs to God. That's pretty clear. Anybody don't understand that? So, I mean, you have to be educated to understand that. Don't touch what belongs to God. By the way, 
Do you know why it says in the book of Isaiah, no weapon formed against you shall prosper? It's one of my favorite Bible verses. Because Satan hates you. There, there may be people that you work with that, that want to tear you down because you're a believer. And they'll try to make a plot against you or something like that. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. You know why? Because you're devoted to God. You belong to God. God owns you. You're his servant. You belong to him. And so uh, so they they got their victory. They went around seven times, complete obedience. And I made myself a little note here. Just as God knows what to do, he knows when to do it. He didn't do it after the first day or the second day or the fifth day or even the sixth day. But on the seventh day, on the seventh time around on the seventh day, God said, that's, the, that's what I want. He wants obedience. Even it's a very weird plan. God may tell you to do something completely out of your character. No, that sounds like something maybe Brother Danny or Brother Ray would do. That don't sound like something I would do. But if God tells you to do it, guess who should do it? Not Danny or Ray. You should do it. You should be obedient to what God tells you to do. Whatever God tells you to do. So, this is their obedience. Be faithful to God. Don't touch the things that don't belong to, uh, uh, to you. It's devoted to God. Only two things are to be saved. That is the gold, the silver, uh, the iron, and the brass are going to the treasury of God. Every animal be killed. Every person is to be killed except for Rahab and her family. Now here we here's the battle. Two verses. Three times we've seen the, the plan. Two verses we have the battle. You know what I think? I'm making a joke here. I don't think this. I know this, Brother Ed. You know what I know? God's word is the most important thing in your life. See, we don't talk to God like he don't just come down to be. That would be so nice if I was sitting on my swing on every morning, sitting there on my swing with my coffee in my hand. Watch Jesus just come down, sitting beside him and said, here's what I want you to do, Daniel. I said, man, this is easy. This is easy. He tells me exactly what to do every morning. But it don't work that way. We search the scriptures. We read their Bible. We see what God's telling us to do. We, 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 we struggle sometimes. We follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And it's, uh, it's not as simple as what it all sets out to be sometimes. So uh, so, so uh, my favorite verse in the entire Bible, in fact, it's on every ink pen we have. It's on the ch church sign, usually to three different places. It's on the, our bookmarks. It's everything we have it's on our chip clips we give out, everything. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So here it is. Here's the victory. So the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 says the walls didn't fall till they shouted. <laughs> but they, the walls did fall because they, the priest blew the trumpets. The walls didn't fall because he marched around it seven times. The walls didn't fall till they did everything God said to do. Everything God said to do. That the wall fell flat, literally underneath. I mean, from underneath itself, shoved down. It fell flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed All that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old. That means every little baby, every little kid. They killed every little baby in the city. Ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. You say, why? Why? Because God said to. This is a holy war. By the way, our nation participates in the holy war. We don't have holy wars. Uh, this was God directly, the, his captain, leading the children of Israel into battle and he gave them over 600 years to repent Rahab repented didn't she it's possible they could have all repented they could have all believed but God says don't let one of them live all of them die every child dies every man dies every woman dies you don't take anything for yourself all the cattle all the sheep everything everything in the city dies but the edge of the sword well, that's the battle. That's the whole battle. There's a lesson for us for 2021 here too, guys, and that's this. We cannot hold on to some small sins. 
say, but but I, I I think if I'd have been there, I might have saved a couple of them babies and act like they're my babies. No, they belong to God. Let me tell you what, those babies went to heaven to be with God. They did. If God had let them live, they may have grown up to be like their daddies and been uh, idol worshippers and heathens and anti-God. There's a lesson for us in 2021. And it's not to kill people. Our lesson is this. We cannot hold on to some small sins. God wants total commitment in our life. God wants everything, Brother Tim. He wants total commitment in our lives. But let me say this about verse 20, 21. Don't you love a verse that has a shout, a trumpet, and people going up? <laughs> I like that because that reminds me of my, uh, one of my other favorite verses you hear preached at every funeral. Or even if they don't preach it, they read it when they get to the graveyard. That is, and the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. And the trumpet of God shall sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and those that are alive and remain shall be called up together. I love it. Same things here. A shout, a trumpet, and people going up. I like every verse in the Bible that's got that. If it's a shout and a trumpet and people going up, it tells me about the day that's going to happen to me. Do you believe that stuff? I really do. If you don't believe that, how do you make it through the day? How, how do you make it through the day if you thought, how do you make it through the day if you didn't think you'd see your nephew again, Brother David? You know, that new Christ the Savior. How do I make it? It's not just like we're going to be raised with a spirit or something like that. No. I'm going to hug my daddy. My daddy's going to hug me, my mom and my father in law, my uncle Loki. I mean, I just go on and on. Just go through the church here, Brother Sylvester and Sister Anita. I look forward to that. I look forward to that, guys. Everyone, in 28 years, we've lost more than we've got coming now. It's true. We've lost more than we've got coming. You never know sometimes how I miss just talking to Brother J. Morgan, just talking to J.C. Just, you know, what's on your mind, J.C.? And, you know, and he... I don't know. I just don't you. I just miss all these people. They, they, I miss them. I miss their fellowship. And then the ones we've lost recently. I miss them. I miss Sister Vicky so bad. I miss Sister Penny. I miss Brother Otis. I miss that old big smile. You never saw Otis. He didn't have old big smile all over him. Every time you saw him, you had an old big smile. You know, I miss him. But you know what? Someday the trump of God's going to sound. And I'm going to see all these people again. I don't have to be in no hurry. What if it takes me cut three or four hundred years to get around to hugging Brother Otis? I can hug him for ten years if I want to. I mean, listen, man, we'll have eternity together. Eternity together. If you know Jesus. If you know Jesus. But Joshua said unto the men that spied out the country, go into the harlot's house. <laughs> Didn't call Rahab the harlot that time, did they? Go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath as you swear unto her. What grace that this harlot, this Canaanite, this idol worshiper <clears throat> become one of God's elect, part of his family. I love Jesus, don't you? I just love Jesus. I love him so much because... He didn't have to choose to save me. He didn't have to let me be born in Mingo County to a son of a deacon, have five uncles as preachers. He didn't have to do none of that, did he? But, but, he, but he loved me. He loved me so much that, that the Holy Ghost spoke to me one day. And I gave my life to Jesus and he washed my sins away. Yes, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. And the young men that were spies went in, brought out Rahab, and her father and her mother and her brethren <laughs> and all that she had, nieces and nephews and all that. And they brought all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. Wow. So many people believed her, didn't they? I would have thought if my sister came to me and she was a whore, I don't know, y'all are supposed to say stuff like that, but... She was a harlot. Well, she's the Bible. She's a harlot. She comes and say, hey, I got a plan. You can get saved. I'd say, say, I like God to save you. You know. 
But she, they believed her. They believed her report about grace and mercy and salvation. Her brothers did. Her daddy did. It says right there, and her daddy did, and her mama did. And a whole bunch of her kindred did. They must have crowded into her house and said, I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I want to know the God of Israel. If that don't make you ashamed, because it sure does me. Salvation through grace. And all we got to do is tell people at the dollar store about it. Some of them might believe. All we got to do is tell our loved ones about it. Some of them might believe, Tony. Sister Vicki, some of them might come around if we keep telling them. I don't know. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, all the silver and the gold, and the vessels of brass and iron they put into the treasure of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive in her father's household and all that she had, that she dwelt in Israel even to this day. By the way, if you remember, she becomes the great, great grandmother of King David. <laughs> wow, that's grace right there. But don't forget, she became the great, 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 I don't know how many greats, I can never count them up. Grandmother of Jesus Christ, your Savior. Yeah, I think it's 14 generations. 14. All right, so 14. Great, 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 there. God put this Rahab the harlot as part of God's family, part of Jesus' family. God, the son that became a human being, is his part of his family. And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that raises up and buildeth the city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof, and he's firstborn. And his youngest son shall set up the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his, uh, his fame was noised throughout all the country. Now, let me say this. This seems like a strange little verse, verse 26. And you think, well, nobody ever rebuilt the fortress again. We know in Jesus' day the city was rebuilt, but the fortress is what he's talking about. Nobody will ever build the fortress again. Well, there was a man that tried, and I'm going to read it to you. Write this down if you'd like to take notes. First Kings chapter 16, verse 34, says this. In his days, Hael, the Bethelite, built Jericho. He laid the foundations thereof, and Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof, and his son Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which God spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. 550 years later. See, it's easy to say that, 550 years. 550 years ago, take you back to when you was in fifth grade, Columbus hadn't sailed the ocean blue. <laughs> 550 years ago, there was no America. <laughs> There was no George Washington. That's hundreds of years after that. 550 years went by. And in the days of King Ahab, the world was so wicked that Hillel thought, I will build back the city. But he didn't finish it because he laid the gates on his own youngest son. God's word is always true. Don't you think just because it's, don't, don't think just because it's been 2,000 years, Jesus said he's coming to get us. He's coming to get us. He's coming to get us. He really is. All right, so let me see. Make sure I didn't miss anything here. Uh, yes, I had, a, I had a little note here from, from Philip Brooks. He was a pastor oh, generations ago, many, many generations ago. He said, he said something like this. I might not have his quote exactly right. I don't always remember stuff exactly. Something like this. Please do not pray to have easy lives. Pray to be better men and women. Pray to be equal to God's task that he has for us. God may have a big job for you, a Jericho for you. Pray to have obedience to do it. I thought that was a good quote. True faith does not look at the obstacles, but it looks to God. We often do not understand every step. However, we trust that he guides us, our steps, and he's able to perform the will that he wants us to do. I don't even know who I stole that from. 
Uh, this has probably been about 40 years ago when I first started preaching. I wrote that down. It wasn't even related to the book of Joshua. I just wrote that down a long time ago. Every, once, every few messages, I try to sneak it in. Let me read it to you again. It's a good one. True faith does not look at the obstacles, but to God. Now, it might have been John or Rice. I'm not sure. We often do not understand every step we take, however, trust that God guides our steps. He is able to perform his will. That's pretty good, guys. Chapter 7. But the children of Israel committed a trespass. But if you go back to chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because the children of Israel no one went in and none came out. Go to chapter 8. And the Lord said to Joshua, Fear not, I love chapter 8, verse 1. Neither be thou dismayed. How many times am I dismayed? Take all the people of war and arise and go up to Ai. I have given into thy hand the king of Ai. Ai means ruins. I've given all the ruins of your life, these people, into your hand. But verse chapter 7 starts with a but. Chapter 6 starts with victory. Chapter 8 starts with victory. Chapter 7 starts with but. <laughs> but. Don't get too many chapter sevens in your life, please, but it does happen to me sometimes. They committed trespass. Trespass, you know what trespass is. You see signs up all the time in southern West Virginia. No trespass. It means don't go where you're not supposed to go. The same Hebrew word sometimes translated transgression. Same idea. Don't go where you're not supposed to go. There are lots of different words for sin in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. But this one means he went where he wasn't supposed to go. In the cursed thing, what did I say a cursed mean? The devoted thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, Zab, Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Judah, man, God's tribe, took of the accursed thing, the devoted thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So I'm going to explain this verse, and then we'll go a little faster through the rest of the chapter. This man, you already know the story, don't you? He took something that he wasn't supposed to take. And what a contrast you could set him into Rahab. Rahab was a Canaanite, but she trusted the God of Israel. Here's a, a man from the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah, the tribe that, that Jacob blessed. The tribe of Judah. The, the tribe that the kings will come from. The tribe that Jesus will come from. He had all the advantages in life. Yet he turned his back on God. He went somewhere he wasn't supposed to go. And he'll be punished. He'll be punished exactly the same way that the people in Jericho were punished. He'll be burned. He'll be completely, utterly destroyed. His, his seed will be wiped off from the face of the earth. All right, so. And Joshua sent men from Jericho. I'm going to read verse 2 through verse 5. And Joshua sent men from Jericho. To Ai. Notice it doesn't say sent men from Gilgal. You know what this means, right? It means they, while they were still at Jericho, he was so drunk with power, Joshua was, that he forgot where the victory came from. And he sent men not from Gilgal. He was supposed to go back to Gilgal every night. But he sent men from Jericho down to Ai, which is beside Beth even on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men and went up and viewed Ai. They returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. As I told you, Ai means ruins, a heap of ruins, literally a heap of ruins. So they were rebuilding the city of Ai. It had been destroyed, actually, by the Egyptians that had come through not too many years before this. They were rebuilding Ai. And uh, so it's not completely finished yet. So it's not in Jericho. So they went up there, the people, about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them 36 men. Now, 36 men is not a large number of men to lose in a battle. But do you know this is the only men that they lost in any battle? over the next seven years. And that's something. Remember in Afghanistan, we hadn't lost a soldier in what? Over a year, I know. 18, 18 months. Hadn't lost a soldier in 18 months. He said, well, we, just, we lost 13 then in 18 months. You know what? 
It don't sound like a lot. But if one of them 13 was your boy, one of them 13 was your daughter, might as well have been 50,000. Yeah. Might as well have been. I mean, it's your, it's your baby. The only men that die in battle that was recorded for us in the whole book of Joshua die here. 36 men. For they chased him before the gate, even under Shebron, which would be a uh, like a rock quarry, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the heart of the people melted and became as water. Remember a few days before this when Rahab had said to the spies, the people's hearts melt. Now the Jewish people's hearts are melting. Now the Jews are filled with fear. Now everything's been flipped upside down. Everything's crazy. Now the Jews are losing the battle. Jericho, let me just give you the names of these because I think it makes a nice story. In verse 2, Jericho means sweet fragrance. And if you go to Jericho and you're outside the city, inside the city, it just smells like a city, doesn't it? Yeah, don't you think it's face going out? It was actually a pretty bad city. Uh, but uh, outside the city, oh, it smells great. There's flowers everywhere, palm trees, it's beautiful. I mean, sweet freight. Ai means pile of ruins. Ai set beside of Beth even, which means house of vanity. And Bethel, the house of God. And I made a little note here. Ruin always lies between the house of vanity, your way and my way, and God's way, Bethel, the house of God. They had no prayer. They had no plan. They were trusting themselves. You know when you're the most dangerous right after God gives you a victory? You're the most wide open because you let your guards down. God gave you that healing you've been praying for for months. And you let your guard down. Paul said we need to walk with circumspectly, walk with our eyes open all the time. It's a military term. Paul used several military terms when he wrote letters in the New Testament. But in the book of Ephesians he says walk circumspectly, walk with your eyes open because you're always in enemy territory. They had their own plan and left God out of their plans. Faith can very often degenerate into presumption and self-confidence. But God had been robbed of his glory. Just, just a heap of ruins had defeated them. Verse 6. And Joshua rent his clothes. I'm read all the way through verse 12. Joshua rent his clothes and fell on the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until evening time. So it's a long prayer. He's going to preach praying a long time. Funny, he didn't pray any gale before he went and sent the 3,000 men out. Now he's praying all day long. And the elders of Israel that put dust on their heads, tore their clothes. <sighs> Fell on the ground. Hmm. Wow. They're very passionate, aren't they? Very passionate. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou and all brought these people over Jordan to deliver us to the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Would to God we had been content to dwell on the other side of Jordan. You know what he sounds like? He sounds like all the whiners that Moses put up with for 38 years. No, he sounds like, why did we have to leave Egypt? It was so good in Egypt. I wish I was back in Egypt. We had onions in. That's by the way, they always mentioned onions. That would not be enticing to me, okay? <laughs> they, 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 they had garlic and onions and leeks and everything. And now he, he sounds like one of the wine he's done. He sounds just like the people that he used to not like. Like the unbelieving generation. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? Verse 8 just makes me mad. I made a note on top of it. It's not your job to make excuses for God. It's not your job to make excuses for God. Joshua, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Lord, why shall I say when Israel turns their back on their enemies? Joshua, it's not, it's not your job, by the way, either. I used to think it was my job when I was a young preacher. See, y'all didn't get me tied. I already pastored eight years at another church. I made a lot of mistakes there. <laughs> I thought I knew a lot of answers that I didn't know the answers to. But you know what I finally found out? It's not my job to defend when somebody says, why did God take my baby? You know what my answer is? I don't know. And I'll pray for you. And I'll cry with you. 
I don't know why. Why did Hurricane Ida come and destroy so many houses? Why have those people lost their lives? It ain't my job to defend God. It's not your job either. Just say, I don't know, but I know God's in control. It's not my job to defend. You know, I know some preachers do. You remember a few preachers got on television after the last big storm we had a few years ago and said, God is angry at New Orleans. God is angry at Louisiana. God is angry. And then I thought, well, how do you know? Did you? Did he tell you? Because he sure didn't tell anybody else that. You know what the best answer always is? Unless, unless you do know. Unless God reveals to you. Somebody says, why did so-and-so have to pass away? Why did I lose my job? Why is my wife so sick? All these questions. It ain't my job to defend God. It's my job to love God. So I just say, I don't know. But I know this. God is a good God. And God never does anything that's evil. Amen? Amen. Amen. I, he just don't check with me. <laughs> he don't check with me. So it's not my job to defend him. All right. So uh, before we keep going, well, let me go on and finish verse 12, and then we'll, we'll talk a minute. For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear it and shall environ, me surround us round, and cut off our name from the earth, and what wilt thou do to thy great name? And the Lord said to Joshua, Get up. I don't really think God spoke King James, <laughs> but uh, that's New King James. Get thee up. That does sound cool, doesn't it? Get thee up. Just get up off the ground, you big baby. That's what he meant. Just get up and quit acting like a two-year-old. Wherefore, liest thou upon thy face. Back in chapter 5, when he met the captain of the Lord's host, he said, take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. And Joshua falls on his face, and God loves the worship that he gives him. He said, now, what are you done laying on your face? You ain't on holy ground. You ain't on holy ground. You ain't doing what I want you to do. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed. That's that same ideal. They've went too far. They've trans trespassed. My covenant, same word, which I commanded them. <clears throat> For they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissimulated, dissembled. That means they uh, had deception. They have put it even amongst their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Now, here's one of the scariest words in the Bible. Neither will I be with you anymore. That's something I don't never want God to ever say to me, Brother Danny. I never want to hear that. I want him to say, I am with thee to the end. Except thou destroy the accursed from among you. Okay, so. All right. The chief problem was Achan. But the rest of the nation had a problem too. They had failed to put God in the proper place. They had failed to pray. 36 men lost their lives because they failed to pray. You can blame Achan for all of them, but Achan ain't the only one to blame. Achan did the, what he did. He, he was a sinner. But the rest of the nation failed God too. Don't forget that. That's why God says, verse 11, they, 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 they're. That's why he says it over and over. The whole nation is guilty. And you're guilty too, Joshua. And I will not be with you, Joshua. Remember how Joshua chapter 1 starts out? I will be with thee, Joshua. Over and over. Three times, I will be with thee, Joshua. I will be with thee, Joshua. And now he says, I will not be with you, Joshua. If you keep what does not belong to you, all right, so, all right, so does anybody remember what the name Achan means? It means troubler. Now, I'm hoping that ain't what they named that baby. I hope they named him Tim or Tony or Daniel or something. And then when he got older, they said, that dude's trouble, okay? Because I know people I've worked with, they've nicknamed trouble. They just call him, that trouble, that trouble, that trouble, you know. So, but... I hope they didn't name the baby Trouble, okay? But that's his name. That's the name that he has now, Trouble, Trouble. He is Trouble. And that's what we're going to see. Up, sanctify the people. And sanctify means cleanse yourself, do the ceremonial cleansing, offer sacrifices. And say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. 
For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is a cursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing. Amen. The devoted thing, remember, devoted to God from among you. Now, I've often, even when I was a child, because I always loved this Sunday school lesson. And in fact, in 1983, I got to teach this Sunday school lesson in Nashville at, at, a, at, a, at a Baptist church in Nashville uh, that was part of the Sunday school lesson. I looked at that old Sunday school lesson preparing for tonight. I got to teach this Sunday school lesson. And I made a little note then, and I'm going to share with y'all now. What was Achan thinking? He's, 36 men died. Ray, is he not thinking, man, I feel bad, that's probably me. Or is he thinking? Here's what I think he's thinking. He's probably thinking, well, I did this, but I bet I wasn't the only one that did this. I bet there's other people that took some of the stuff and stole some of the stuff. Because you know what happens when you're a sinner? You want to make everybody else a sinner. Try to justify. Everybody at that church is a bunch of hypocrites. They ain't a good person. Every one of them is a bunch of hypocrites. That's what you say until you get saved, and then them hypocrites never look so good. <laughs> they never look so good as the night you fell on your knees and gave your life to Jesus. All them hypocrites look good then. In the morning, therefore, shall you be brought. We won't finish the chapter like I thought, Brother Jeremy. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof. <clears throat> and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. There's not going to be any more secrets. It's going to be made very public what's going to happen here. There's an old message. I guess every preacher's preached it. Be sure your sins will find you out. Your sins will find you out. And they always use Judah and Tamar. They always use Achan. They're the same ones because they're good lessons. The reason these are good Bible lessons is because they're great Bible lessons. That's why every preacher preaches them because they're, they're, they're Bible lessons for us. You can't hide your sins. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire just like the people of Jericho. And all that he hath because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord. And because he hath wrought folly in Israel. See what notes I have here. Okay. So Joshua rose up early in the morning for this distasteful job he was about to do. Brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. I'm going to tell you what each one of these means as we go, and you'll see how blessed that Achan was. Judah means praise. You knew that already, though, didn't you? Judah means praise. Praise to God. And he brought the family of Judah, praise, and he took the, and he took the family of Zerahites. That means the rising, 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 like worship, raising your hands to God. And he brought the family of Zerahites, man by man, and Zab, Zabdi was taken. Zabdi, it's, here's what his name means, it's called where you live in the country. It either means blessed or blessed. <laughs> Here in the south, we say blessed. <laughs> he is a blessed man. He's blessed by God. That's a cool name to have. Now, that's a good name. I like that name. And he brought his house man by man, and Achan, troubler, the son of Carmi. Carmi means fruitful. Literally, literally, the Hebrew word is my vineyard. My vineyard. That's, that's another cool name, isn't it? The son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah. Joshua said unto Achan, my son, this is where we're going to stop at, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord, God of Israel, and make confession unto him. Tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Whew. All right, so here is the ghost family, ghost tribe, clan, family, man, family again and right down to the very man that did this and he failed God but I love that Joshua was so tender to him what does it say there in the Hebrew my son my son I don't know if he had, you know, too many people I doubt that Joshua actually knew Achan he may have I don't know he's for, certainly from a very prominent family my son give glory to the Lord I know this much, that 
I have failed the Lord. And I'm glad that my judgment has already been paid by the other Joshua, Jesus Christ. This man is going to confess. I'm just going to go ahead and give you a little head story. Well, let me read one more verse. Just, just, just one more verse. And Achan answered Joshua, we'll go to verse 20, and said, Indeed I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. We'll read the thus and thus next week, the Lord's will, if Jesus doesn't come and get us. I have sinned. He confessed his sin. I have no doubt in my mind that when we get to heaven, we will meet Achan. We will see the man. I think that God forgave him. He confessed his sin. Seven times in the Bible, it says that it had used that phrase, I have sinned. The last time it's used in the Bible is in the book of Luke, when Jesus himself, Joshua, was telling a story about a boy that was brought up with a brother and a very wealthy dad. You remember that story? We call him the prodigal son, don't we? And he leaves, and then he comes back, and the first thing he says to his dad is, I have sinned. I have sinned. I believe the man truly was sorry for his sin. He still has to be punished. He still has to die. He's going to die. The difference between him and you today, Sister Barb, is this. Jesus already died. When we confess our sins, we don't have to pay for them. He washes our sins away. Well, there may be repercussions, you know, there have been some people that, uh, who was that guy, Bundy? What was his first name? Ted. Ted Bundy. That had committed all those rapes and murders. He confessed his sins and came to Christ the Savior. The Lord forgave him of his sins. He still had to be put to death because that's what the government demanded. But Jesus washed his sins away. What I'm saying is I'm glad that Jesus washed my sins away. I can't get over it. I've been struck by it for the last three or four days since Sunday morning. I'll, I keep thinking no matter what I'm trying to study. I've already got most of all the Sunday morning's message finished. You know, I keep thinking, I'm glad Jesus saved me. I can't get over it this week. I just can't get over it. Jesus saved me. We deserve so little to give so much. Yes. Oh, yes. I mean, why? I mean, why? But anyhow, so Lord's will, we'll pick up in verse 21 next week. It's a cool story, what he does, what he says, and even what happens, in, so we'll do at least finish those few verses there. Chapter 8 is a small chapter, so we'll do all of chapter, finish that, and chapter 8, that'll be our plan if the Lord tears us come. Let's pray, and then we'll take time for comments this evening. Brother David, would you lead us to the Lord in prayer? Mm. Precious Father, our, our hearts are just open and full of you. We glorify you that you have taken up your residence in us, that you have imparted your spirit to us, Lord, that, that you have taken residence up in us, and, and we reflect your glory. But Lord, may, may we be the light to this community that you would have us be. May, may we not only love you and, and love people, but also to be sure to give a clear witness and testimony about you and your glory. Lord, we thank you for this story and, and for, for the truths that, that, that we see in it. Yes. We pray that each of us will, will just concentrate on this and, and lift it up in prayer. Lord, we, we just think of our nation. We, we, we've already reflected on much of what's going on in, in the world and, and our failure to, to continue to support Israel as we should. Oh, and yet, God. Lord, our hearts are fixed on Abraham Please, and bless him. Mercy on us. And bless, bless that nation. And, and we pray your blessing of upon them. And so, Lord, we, we also pray for all the prayer requests that have already been lifted up tonight for loved ones and family members and all their trials and their struggles that they're in. So, may we just be a blessing unto you. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.